There are many things you can't serialize natively in Unity, and C-sharp types are one of them. There are all kinds of reasons you might want to be able to choose a C-sharp type from the editor, not the least of which is that you can start to make your code much more dynamic. I had a simple problem this week. I wanted to be able to choose C-sharp types for my state machine and for my event bus from the editor. I ended up being able to serialize types and also be able to filter and choose them from a drop-down menu in the inspector. Let's walk through it together. All right, well, the first thing I want to do is create a new type extension method. I want to be able to check if a given type inherits or implements a specified base type. Let's open this up in Rider. First of all, we can clean this up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to need to use system and I'm also going to use link for this. And so we don't need to inherit from mono behavior, but this is an extension method, so it needs to be inside of a static class. Let's write a helper method that will determine whether or not a given type is a generic instance or a generic definition. If this type is not a generic type instance, we're just going to return the type. Otherwise, we're going to get the generic type definition. Then we can say if that definition is different than the original type, we'll return the definition. Now we can create one more helper method that can take a type and determine if any of the interfaces that it actually uses match a given type. So we can just get all the interfaces, then use link to search through all of them and resolve the generic type of each one, and then just check and see if it's a match. So our actual extension method here has to be static. We'll call it inherits or implements. And it needs the this keyword, of course, because it's an extension method. So we'll take in the type and the base type. And first of all, let's resolve both of those. Now we can drill down into the type until we actually reach type of object, which would be the very bottom. Now, if our base type equals the type, or if the has any interfaces method returns true, then we know that this particular type implements or inherits from the base type. Otherwise, let's resolve the type of type.base type and put that into our type variable for the next iteration of the loop. If that happens to be null, we're gonna return false. And if we make it all the way out of this loop, we are also gonna return false. So the only way that this will ever be true is if we find a match while iterating. I'm gonna move the public method up to the top and I'm just gonna paste in a little bit of documentation here as well. You can find links to all of today's code in the video description. Next, let's make an attribute that will allow us to actually filter different fields by type. I'm going to call it the type filter attribute, and it's just going to inherit from property attribute. I'll move it into its own file here. So our new attribute here is actually going to need a way to filter things. We can do that with a system func. In the constructor of our attribute, we can accept the kind of type that we want to limit this field to be. Then our filter will operate on that type using our extension method. We can also say, can't be abstract, can't be an interface, can't be a generic type. That means that when we use this attribute on a field, the value is always going to have to be a concrete implementation of that type. All right, now let's make a class that will actually allow us to serialize this type. I'm just going to call it serializable type, and I'm going to implement the iSerialization callback receiver interface. So this interface has two methods. One is the on before serialize method, and then there's an on after deserialize. I don't really need either of these to be public methods, so I'm going to use the explicit implementation. Then, of course, one other thing we need to do here is actually make this class serializable. Now, we can't actually serialize a type, but we can serialize its assembly qualified name. This is the string that you would get returned to you if you were to use the method type get type. So why don't we store that as a serialized field here, and we can start it with string.empty. When that string gets modified inside of Unity, these callbacks are going to get fired off, and we'll be able to set the type correctly. Let's make a helper method, try get type. So this will use that get type method with that string name. We can populate the type variable with the result of our type.getType method, and then we can set true or false based on whether or not there was a result and whether or not there was actually something in our qualified name string. Now we can fill out the two callbacks. On before serialize will let us set the string name. So as long as type is not null, we can use assembly qualified name property and put it in there. If it was null, let's just keep whatever the value was before. 
And the other method on after deserialize is where we're actually going to set the type. So here's where we can use the try get type method by passing in the assembly qualified name and getting an out variable. Now, if there was some error getting the type, let's put out a message and just return. Otherwise, we'll set type equals to the type. All right. So this will actually work as it stands, but how would we actually use it? And is it convenient? If I jump over to my hero class here, I'm going to make a whole bunch of interfaces and classes that we can just use as demo stuff. So to simulate what it would be like working with the event bus, I'll make a basic interface for that and a couple implementations. But then I'd also like to simulate what it's going to be like working with my state machine, because that was the original impetus for wanting to serialize types in the first place. Although I've since thought of quite a few other good reasons for it. So I'll just add a few basic states here. Now up in the hero class, let's add a few headers and underneath each header, we can have a few serialized fields for each of these. And now each of my serialized fields is also going to use the type filter. If I want to be able to select a state in the inspector, I really want to be filtering by I state. If I want to choose an event, I should be filtering by I event. So I'll just add a few more fields here. Maybe we can call this one game over, and then maybe we could have one more for some other event in the game. Maybe level complete, that would be good. Oh, yeah. Copilot's got that figured out. Now we could have a start method here, so we could actually debug a little bit of output and make sure everything's working the way we want. We need to inherit from model behavior in order to do that. And then what I'll do is I'll just have a few lines here. We could debug out the types of some of these things, and Maybe on top of that, we could also try out our extension method as well, because we can use that in more places than just our filter. What's great about this extension method is that we can use it to test to find out if things not only use a particular interface, but if they derive from a particular base class. We might as well try that out on the events as well. And with that done, we can go have a look at what's going on in Unity. So I've recompiled and I've added the component to my hero game object. And you can see now it's exposed that string, the assembly qualified name on each of these serializable types. Now this would work just fine, except for the actual return value from type.getType is this long string here. Not only is this extremely prone to human error to try and type this thing out all the time, but it's inconvenient. Wouldn't this be so much better if we use the type that we're filtering on to create a drop-down list for each of these with a nice friendly name that we could just choose? Let's make a property drawer. So I've made an editor folder and created a new file here, serializable type drawer. It inherits from property drawer and I've given it the proper attribute here. So we're gonna need to grab a reference to that type filter attribute. We're also going to cache both the assembly qualified names as well as make a friendly name that we can show on a drop down menu. And we're going to gather all that information in the initialize method. I only want the initialize method to run one time to cache these values. So if we've already put some values into the array, we're just going to return early. Otherwise, we're going to first of all, grab that filter. Now we can reach into the assemblies and we can use the filter with link here to actually put all of those into an array. So every type that matches the filter is going into our filtered types variable. Now let's fill up our friendly names. We can take the filtered types and use link again, and we're going to use the reflected type property of the type class. Now reflected type really means the enclosing class. So for example, if I had, let's say, for example, my hero had a subclass, then I'd like my menu to say hero.subclass when I'm choosing. Otherwise, we can just use the name of the type. Now we can take all those longer assembly qualified names and put them right into the type full names array. Now, it's possible that uh, the programmer forgot to specify a type filter, in which case we could just use a default. It's going to produce a really big list, but at least it won't be null. And certainly when you see the list, it's going to remind you, you probably want to filter it down a little bit more than it actually shows up because it's going to grab every single concrete type in the assemblies that it finds. So now that we've got the arrays populated, let's work on our on GUI method. So as soon as I've got the method signature filled out here, what I'll do is call the initialize method first. That'll make sure that our arrays are populated correctly. After that, let's get the assembly qualified name string right off of this particular property. So we can use the find property relative method for that. 
Now, it's possible that that string was actually empty, and there's a few different things you could do here. I think to keep it simple for now, all I'm going to do is say, if that string was empty, let's just grab the first full name from our array and put it in there. And then we have to apply the modified properties, of course. So we can do that. That's one way of validating. You can get more fancier than that if you want to. With that out of the way, let's get some index numbers for our drop-down menu so we can get figure out which index is our current selection and then we're going to want another index which is you know the one that we're about to choose and we can get that out of the editor GUI dot pop-up method pop-up method is going to give us that drop down menu now in the drop down menu you can see i'm passing the type names which is our friendly names now if our selection in the menu comes back as a positive number we know that's the name we want to use, so we can grab the full assembly qualified name and assign it. Now we could also have a check here to say as long as it's not the same as before. And if that all happens, again, we need to apply the modified properties. And that's it. That's our whole property drawer. Now we can go try it out in Unity. So if we have a look here, I've got these nice drop downs now. And you can see I have my three states, walking, running, and jumping. And then my events also can choose from the two events that I defined, event A and event B. So I'll set some selections here and just hit play and watch what happens in the debug log. And there we go. Our debug log is showing the correct names for each of our selections. And it's also saying true for all the results from our extension method. So the sky's the limit with what you can do with this information. Obviously, you can now instantiate types dynamically chosen in the editor. I'll be using mine for making decisions based on types inside of my state machine and for events that I'm going to publish to the bus. But my mind's already started thinking about an S-scope solution, and I know I'll probably use this for predicates as well. So that's all I've got for you today. I'll see you in the next one.